Welcome to the Books to Business podcast. This week we have Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. I'm conflicted to see whether or not we go through this book fast or slowly. Yeah. 22 this, hours of... This thing uh, is a beast. It was a big one. Um, right out of the gate, there's going to be like... We're, we're, we're sort of picking and choosing mm-hmm. what, what we're going to talk about, what we feel is important, because this thing is... It's, it's like a textbook, essentially. I thought the same thing. I... I I was talking to a friend of mine. I was about 15 hours into it this weekend. I went up to New England, and I'm like, like this, I, it didn't read to me like a book would read. It read to me more like a swipe file. There's some really good ideas in here, for sure. Like we can extract some ideas on, on uh, particularly if you're in business. I mean, the, the application here, in my opinion, is for selling and influencing people. Because people have two brains. They have one that, that makes snap decisions, and they have one that's an analytical brain that kind of, it kind of slows things down and, and puts things under, under a microscope a little bit. So maybe that'd be a good spot to start. Yeah, all right. The two, uh, the two systems. Let's do that. So, I mean, and that's basically the, the preface to the whole book. There's our, our brains, there's a system one and there's a system two. And so system one, and, and feel free to pop in uh, whenever, but the, the, the way that I think of it uh, is more automatic. It's you're not thinking about it it's reactive. You hear something and you turn, right? Right. It's, there's not a lot of detail or thought process going on. And then system two is the other side, which she says, basically when system one is confused or can't figure it out, that's when system two comes in. And that's when we're thinking about things. That's when we're focused on something and trying to use, um, you know, uh, a rational thought. Did you did you out. think about it like the like system one is the old like the reptilian brain the the, the ones that, that taught us how to survive all these years with instincts and and snap decisions the fight or flight type idea and system two is the more logical current brain that's kind of like what I got out of it system two because uh, the right brain in selling they always say the right brain buys left brain justifies yeah I think system one is the right brain feelings emotions instincts. And two is the analytical brain. And if you if you're if you're selling and you're and you're posted up in system two, you're going to struggle, in my opinion. Right. Uh, so you got to know the differences. And in this book, he gives a, a many many examples of uh, which system when, so to speak. Right. Because if you're surviving and you're in a situation, um, you know, and you got to make a, a split decision. Like you've got to uh, defend yourself from a, a predator, or you're in a jungle and you see a lion jump out at you, right? Right. <laughs> well, well, the whole yeah. I mean, that's that's the whole point is that like we need both systems, right. but because system one is so uh, quick to react, yeah. that we make a lot of mistakes because of it. When really, in a perfect world, we'd have the foresight, we'd understand to go, you know, to move into system two. But that's right. not how it works. Our subconscious does a lot more than we think it does. The brain's way faster, and we think it's way more accurate than it really is because it makes uh, it makes up things in the middle. And one of the things I liked about the book was the concept of the halo effect. Like you see somebody that maybe, like he, he gave the example of uh, a coach that goes on and sees a tall, handsome, well-dressed player, mm. and he gets a halo effect of that player thinking, oh, that player must also be an exceptional player because look how good he looks. He looks like the, the, the typical athlete, but the coach doesn't have all the data. So the coach gives that, that player the halo effect. Yeah. Maybe, you know, at some, at some level, authority is like that in, in these biases. Oh, for sure. Yeah, as we, we study cognitive biases, these are all like brain, you know, tricks your brain uh, does to you. Uh, sometimes you're going to be right, but Sometimes you're going to be wrong. Like if you're a coach and you get a big game on the line, you don't want to go to system one and give someone this halo effect and go on your gut and say, oh, this is going to be my starting quarterback when they had all the data and they could make that. That's a system two function. Yeah. Do the evaluation. And we've seen that in a few books. With the absence of data comes narrative, comes story, comes using the things that um, are available to us. Right, right, that we've experienced and using that to make a decision. I am using that a lot with the, the Brene Brown book. She says, in the absence of data, Sa- you start... Safe to say we underestimated how many good concepts were in that book. Like when I first read it, I didn't realize how much I'd be using yeah. those principles. And that wasn't even her, her big book. That was like her second book, yeah. like her big book. This is the book that kind of brought her concept of vulnerability to business. But there's a lot of science in, in kind of the, the leadership qualities. And what's, what I love about... Like this book here is this could be a swipe file book for all books, like the cognitive. Uh, when you say swipe file, what do you mean? Swipe file is like something you're always going to want to have. Open it up, 
and you know and look look through it for ideas mm. particularly if you're writing ad copy or you're you're structuring there's a lot of things in here about about selling how the brain thinks fast and slow when you're selling you definitely want people to be you know feelings you want to be in the right brain you want them making decisions that are good ethical decisions because you put a good ethical message out there but you don't want someone confused and when they get confused it automatically system one stops and says hey system two i need you to take a look at this and they start digging around through it yeah. and of course the old saying in sales is the confused buyer doesn't buy they just don't um and in, you know there, there's a lot of a lot of awesome context about that in here yeah, like or cool ideas. In my opinion, they're they're awesome. Derivative of the old Donald Miller quote that we've used so many times before, like the cognitive fluency thing. When it's, you make things difficult, people don't buy. People it's the same thing. On. Yeah, yeah. Cognitive fluency, um, and and um, you know he has a couple cousins in here. One's called cognitive ease and cognitive strain. Right. One of the exercises that I thought was kind of cool is um, if you had two pieces of paper and one had a message written in very large font and the other one had a message written in very small font mm -hmm. and you wanted to hide some errors in the messages in the, in the same message which one would be more likely to see the errors it's actually in the smaller one because you're, you're focused yeah your brain kind of skips words when you're when you're reading you can see it so it's going through you're very easily going through it cognitive ease and then the other one strain you're like your brain strains and it slows you down it slows your whole system down um and you see that a lot with people that that put you know when we coach they're putting ad campaigns together or they're trying to they're trying to tell the world what they do and it's confusing confusing as hell yeah what were you saying today we we're doing the the movie trailer the book trailer for drive right what, well, I, I was like what, what i was like all these notes we have for this book right yeah these are all the notes we have and i said and eddie writes the script for the uh video what'd you say i loved so, it yeah so long story short i mean it's it's a what a 90 second uh script and yeah. so you know there's not much time for detail and so you were basically like hey here's the book i have some good notes and you do there's some great notes in mm -hmm. there uh but basically i said uh detail is going to be the enemy here because you want you know at the most three concepts you want to pull on some some heartstrings and move on you know? I think if that's the case for Drive, it's more so the case for this book because there's some there's some concepts in here I don't quite get yet. Yeah. In fact, I told Steve to be be ready to look up words. Ready. Look, be ready on standby one, Maverick. There's just a lot to consider. It, it's funny. It's almost <laughs> irony because I mean he speaks against. You know, he talks about things being in small, digestible, consumable mm -hmm. bites. And this is like this monstrosity that never ends. <laughs> it's like yeah. wow. I don't know. We mentioned he he won the Nobel Prize in economics. Mm -hmm. And he's a psychologist. That's that was like the fluke. Like the, a psychologist wins the Nobel Prize in economi economics, and this is the big basis of the book is uh, called prospect theory. And that's uh, it's basically a, a, a loss aversion mindset that people have. You know, they they don't want to lose. They they don't like winning as much as they hate losing. Hmm. Anyway. Can you think of an example of, of he you doing said, that? Yeah, he said if you had a 100% chance to lose $900 or, or uh, you, know, you lose $900 for sure or a 90% chance to lose $1,000, which one would you pick? Yeah, uh, I, I would gravitate to I, I play conservative. Yeah, or be yeah. risk averse. For yeah, sure. everybody is. Yeah. Uh, a casino is a better example. That one's kind of kind of cloudy a little bit, but a casino is if you went to a casino and you won a thousand dollars versus to pretend a thousand dollars is a week's pay, right, right to you, and then you also went a week later and you lost a thousand dollars, you would talk about the loss of a thousand dollars five times more than you would the win. Like if you went out and lot and won a week's pay, you wouldn't talk about it as much. Um, and there is, and there's a lot of science behind it. Of course, he won the Nobel Prize. This is science based on on why did that happen? Why do people people hate losses? Like that's why people stay in, uh, in in bad marriages longer. Like the failure is so painful versus right. a, you know uh, sticking it out. Stocks that are tanking. Like people hang on to stocks right now. They may have, should have sold, but they didn't because the they're afraid of loss. Yeah, I remember reading that in the uh, the happiness hypothesis. So maybe we should do that book at some point. That's a great. We pulled it out. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, over we there. pulled the book out for Steve to uh, contact the author. Is he still alive? 
Steve? The author. <laughs> <laughs> um, he gives a, a similar reference where he's saying someone goes to dinner and it's just this amazing experience. And they go and it's, you know, 99 times it's incredible. But once there's a cockroach on their plate, they're never going back. Right. Because okay. the, uh, uh, that one bad situation derails everything, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like, I guess it's, it's a cousin of what we're talking about. But yeah. We want to avoid <clears throat> negativity much more than we're incentivized and inclined to. Uh, yeah, you know, go after the upside of things. People don't like the the bad things that happen. Like we're we're also talking about. Uh, I forget what the principle was. Maybe you can find it, Steve. Where where um, people think they're more likely to die from COVID nineteen, for instance, than they are like heart disease or an automobile accident. I think it's availability, right? Isn't that how we? It could, yeah, it's the availability. It's the availability heuristic because it's the rule of thumb that this information is so readily available through the media. Right. Everything pops on like, oh, someone died a doctor. Like you know, the, the reality is the data is saying that most people that are dying, I'll probably get yelled at for this, but most of them are in nursing homes. Like. A high degree, like fifty percent plus. Yeah. Um, and then one person dies. It's you know younger, and that becomes the rule for the the whole. Like oh, someone else dies. Now it's very possible that they could die, but it's not. It's an exception. It's very unlikely. Like statistically, more likely uh, that you'd get hit by a car and and die. There are so many times in everyday life in society where we base what we do around the exception to the rule because we mm. hear it and right. it's. You know, it's accessible, it's available. It's, if you watch, that's why I always say the mainstream media or the news that sells negativity, right. it's really, I mean, these things are not real life. Right. There's the, the chance that we'd get COVID-19 out today is zero, essentially, right? I mean, it's, it's l- so small. And yeah. now, granted, we're respectful and we wear masks and we go mm-hmm. out and we do our thing. Right. But like, it's just, if you look at the numbers, if you truly analyze them, we did it once at the peak. You remember we did play playing with the numbers at the peak of the COVID situation in Florida. I think it was uh, late April. What did we do? Or uh, late March. What we were talking we? about the numbers were filling stadiums. Oh right, I mean I remember that that it, it was one person. No one. One has person it. died out of. Uh, I remember doing the numbers backward to say that's in it, you know because someone didn't understand like we got one person in Broward County. Right. which has 2 million people at the time. It was like a, under 20 or 30 people at the time. And not to belittle any death by any means. But the media is playing you, and they're using, this, the, they're using these cognitive triggers to es- escalate a situation. And it was an example, like it'd be like having 10 American Airlines arenas full and only one person has it and died <laughs> from it in all 10 arenas. Like right. if you're ever in an arena, you look around, you see 20,000 people. Um, and that's that's just you know the reality of the statistics, but uh, like terrorism is the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I just read a statistic that you know if, if you look at a country that's had a lot of terrorism, if you think about the Middle East, like uh, any of those uh, countries, the number for people that die in a, a, a motor vehicle accident on a daily basis is always 10x what terrorism kills, right. Right. if not 100x. This isn't a political statement in any way right this is just the reality is our minds play tricks on us because we hear information and in through the availability heuristic as it's called here and a heuristic is just a, a rule of thumb because uh, what happens is your brain's asked to make these decisions sometimes they're very complex decisions like what are the odds of me um you know, getting COVID-19 if I go to uh, Costco today to get some toilet paper mm-hmm. right the odds are almost nil but everywhere I go, someone's dying from, the, from it, right? And I see around there and everything I hear on TV. So now the reality of that is very, very large. I'm way more afraid of that than dying from, you know, a head-on collision from someone who's texting. Right. I'm like, like 10,000 times more likely to die from that. That's a great example. Car yeah. versus plane. People worry right. about planes. And, yeah. Like, I forget what's the, the number, but you're... Way more exponentially more likely to die in a car. Um, so yeah, yeah. Well, the lazy mind, you know, it all comes down to the fact that we're, our minds are super lazy because we've we've evolved to survive. We've evolved to use as little energy as possible, mm. right? And that's a you know that's a survival because because energy used to be scarce. So our brains go into like quick mode, like they don't want to spend a lot of time and effort. So you know, system one's always like that's the decision. It's making all these decisions really quick, low energy. And then when, when, when faced with the fact that, you know, the split decision is wrong, like the, the lazy mind got it wrong, is the example, like everybody here, do this, do this exercise in your head. 
Uh, I love this one. Everyone so far that I've done it with has gotten it wrong. All right, here's the example. Let's see if I don't screw this up. A bat and a ball together cost a dollar ten. The ball's ten cents. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the bat cost? And system one's going to always answer, like you did and Steve did as well. Like ten a, cents, a dollar. No, you an, you answered a dollar. Like you, the system one says, if the ball's ten cents and the bat's a dollar more than the ball, the bat costs a dollar, right? But that would only be ninety cents, right? Because yeah. the ball's the ninety cents differential. The correct answer is a dollar five. So system one will answer it incorrectly, and then system two gets called in. Once you know you're wrong, you're going to take out a piece of paper and go through it. Now, everybody who's watching and listening has seen the little social media posts about the turkey and the bananas and the, you know, and the image of three turkeys plus two drumsticks equal. It's a All mathematical, math yeah, it's a mathematical kind of exercise, but it's a trick. It's a system one trick, and everybody gets it wrong. Because system two is required to fill that out. You need to have the logical brain step in and count and go through a careful exercise. Hmm. Um, in selling and persuasion, it's very, very powerful, and it could be easily used unethically, very easily. How so? Well, you can, you can, you can kind of create an illusion, you know, like a, you know, overuse of the halo effect, overuse of uh, heuristics that may not be necessarily accurate. Um, you know, in cars and things and using statistics and using uh, the availabil availability of um, accidents and things like that to create a, an unusually uh, compelling reason, probably more so than needed be, is to buy the car. So that's like the... Um, you can stack them all together. Amazon drop shipper who's standing next to a Lambo. True. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you think all Amazon drop shippers are, <laughs> have a Lamborghini. <laughs> right. Like none of them do. Right. Like very few people. Most of them rent it if they have one. Um, yeah, that's that's like that's like that's why so many people run out and say, "I want to, I want to be an Amazon drop shipper." Have you had anybody talk to you about that? No, I just saw a video on it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Apparently, apparently that's a big thing. Well, another example would be anchoring. Like Amazon does it. Like the the ethical use of this of these cognitive triggers. I mean. There's a lot of them in here. Is 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 an Amazon like they do have some of these tr triggers? Like there's a there's, he talks about anchoring, like anchor somebody to a price. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times at Amazon, you see like a device that you can buy for the hundred percent its cost, and maybe it's two hundred dollars, and your brain's anchored to that, and they strike a line through it and give it to you at a lower price. Right, like anchoring. Um, there was an example about what do we see in the book? There Redwoods. Was an example. Redwoods. Redwood trees, estimating the height oh, of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, basically there's, there's a redwood tree, and you're supposed to guess the height. Right. And so he gave, you know, two numbers as a starting point, right? He gave one, he gave one number. Yeah, but he gave it to two different groups. So right. one number was high. Right. And then he said, oh, maybe it's, it's the redwood trees are usually this tall. Right. What's your guess? Well, with the, the high number. One, yeah. And then same redwood tree says to another group, they're usually this tall and gave a smaller number. And both groups gauged their guess was closer to the number that was given, in right. other words. Was that just way what's too confusing? Yeah, that was, no, that's similar. Was, how'd, you, how'd you read that? Uh, he would ask them just a, like a uh, vague question, kind of just asking uh, would you say it's taller or shorter than 500 feet? And based on that question, uh, their next response, but okay, well, if you say shorter, how tall do you think it is? It'd be very close to the 500 uh, as compared to if he says, okay, would you say it's taller than shorter? To another group, he asked 2,000 feet. Taller or shorter, they'd, they'd say very close to 2,000 feet. So it's just like based on whatever number he gave first, it would be very close to their second guess. Mm. It's strange. So they're anchored to their... The first question. The yeah. mind the mind does that. Car it's car sales people do it all the time. When you when you um, go in to see a, a car, they'll typically if you go in to see a car, let's say it's the base model Toyota Camry. Yeah. They for whatever reason won't have that available for you to look at. They'll always drop you in the like the Cadillac best version of it. That's usually thirty, forty percent more money. Mm. And they'll put you in that car and they'll have you feel it and then they'll anchor you to that that fully loaded car. 
So they'll say, oh, it's, and they usually do it in months, by the way. They don't do it in, in the whole price. They'll say, oh, this one's only $800 a month. And you came in in your head with a, an idea that you might want to spend $300 a month like you were in your other car. Mm-hmm. So they're anchoring, or anchoring you to $800. Right? So your, your high high is way higher than your old high high. So now you're coming down from the, 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 the anchor. And you, know, you might land at five or 600 a month when you had no intention of spending that. That's, in my mind, is an unethical use of that technique. You think that's unethical? I do. Yeah, I do. You yeah. see it on, on Amazon all the yeah. time. You see it everywhere. You Anytime walk. there's a markdown price, you know? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, I, mean I, I guess it'd be debatable, right? There's a lot of car sales people out there, you know, but, um, and I'm not saying they're all bad people, but a lot of times you'll put, they'll put people in and they'll always anchor to the absolute highest. Mm. Um, it's, a, it's a, you know, it's a, the law of contrast too. I mean, you could compare something that is valuable to something that's way more valuable and the value of the second item will look bigger. Yeah, that's a... It's a similar Three. bias. I don't know what it's called. Do you remember? Isn't there something where it's kind of, it's almost like you hit them with such a strong shot, like you give them such a high price on something that anything lower seems like a good deal? It's contrast. Yeah. Contrast yeah, one? Yeah. yeah cause that's what it reminds me of. Yeah. That's what it is. Definitionally, right? Yeah. Super Contrasting. Weird. There's a contrast in there too. Did, remember the, uh, you and I had a conversation because Phil, Nick, Phil Mickelson and Tiger Woods played, who'd they play yesterday? They played Tom Brady or Brady, something. Brady Tom Brady and Peyton, Peyton Manning. Well, so who were the teams? It was it was Woods and Manning, and then Brady and Mickelson. Brady was with Mickelson. Brady knocked in a ball from the fairway. Did you see him drop that long shot? I didn't. No. Oh yeah, he dropped it because Charles Barkley was giving, was yapping in his ear, and Brady stu- stood up and knocked it from the fairway and dropped the dropped the uh, shot. Oh nice. Uh, but I guess they lost. But the you know. It's a good example of golf because we're talking about Tiger Woods as the example because we're talking about a, a concept in here he calls regression to the means, which I think is a good playoff of uh, Daniel Pink's book, Drive, because he talks about rewards and punishment. And regression to the mean always, it's the law that some kind of exceptional, excellent performance will always be followed at some point by a poor performance mm. to create the average, the mean, and like if Tiger Woods went out and shot 13 under, which he's done before in some crazy courses, like it's crazy way over his average. And he goes way out in front. And sometimes he follows it up with some good scores. But normally by the end of the tournament, it gets close to what the tournament usually is. Yeah. It's called regression to the mean. And when you, when you praise somebody for, this is what's wild about this. If you praise someone for something good they did, like let's say they had an exceptional year, like you did a video and it got all these incredible incredible reviews somehow something happened some kind of luck Mm -hmm. and you had this big performance and i congratulated you i almost always will be disappointed because the next video will be more like the mean yeah you know type of thing and that's with performance like if 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 your kid does something that's amazing like way beyond their ability and you praise them you're almost always going to be disappointed after the praise and the and the funny thing is that you know if you if you, you hammer on them for doing something bad if they're really below their performance level, they're almost always going to do better anyway. Like whether or not you, you, you berated them or not, they'll still do better because of the regression to the mean that the, the loss is they'll, they'll do better. Yeah. So why bother beating up on anybody? It's an important life lesson. Like yeah. things always sort of more or less are what they are. I, mm-hmm. I remember I used maybe the four, four years out of college, like the kids on my, my rowing team, we do a fantasy baseball league mm-hmm. and I won pretty much every year with this simple idea that so every year before the season starts they rank all the players right. and they rank all the players based on the year before right so if player x had a terrible year they would be way down in the rankings next year for the draft right and the idea is and people don't look at the mean they look at last year so for example some some nobody hits 40 homers last year right. Well, this year they're going to rank them high, and people are going to want them. The availability, the availability of the information, the availability. It's interesting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But if you look at, at the aggregate, he doesn't hit 30 home runs. He hits 12 a year, so he's probably going to hit 12 next year. So don't draft them high, right? And right. so if you start looking at people, you know, again, the, the mean, the average, as opposed to these one-off and these anomalies, you'll be way better off in the long run. It's the simplest strategy, but That's, it's like... You, you were telling me about that. I didn't get it until you just told me. So you were using system two, a more analytical outlook at it, and, and discounting all that available information. 
Right. And that's interesting. Use all the theories together to create a more logical, um, in this case, you won. Yeah. yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. You know, we Red Sox fans, you always, with, with David Ortiz, like he was on fire once. Remember that? That one year he... We, every year in April, the Boston sportscasters, every year, David mm-hmm. Ortiz is done because he couldn't hit in April. Right. I, he, you had to hear him, people saying yeah. he was done from like 2006 to whenever he retired. It's like, no, he has a slow April. This is what he hits every year. This is what he he's going to right, He follows <laughs> yeah. right to it. So bad, bad performance is followed by steadily good performance regressing, regressing to the mean. Right. That's so powerful. Baseball is like the perfect metaphor. It really is. It, yeah, because it, it, averages, it averages out. And yeah. they, you know that's why this guy won the Nobel Prize in, in economics as a psychologist because he connected the dots between psychology and behavioral because this is in behavioral economics. Like mm. that's why people people and money don't do well. Do you know the average the average mutual fund over a twenty year period? Let's say and I don't, I'm not accounting for because I haven't looked at it in years. But the average mutual fund for like thirty years did ten percent. You know what the average investor got? What? Maybe two or one. Because the investors bought, bought things on the way up and sold things when they were down. They mm-hmm. responded to the available information. They did it emotionally. And by design, that strategy has, has people buying high and selling low. So it's a, it's a built-in loser. And, that was, uh, and that's interesting cause, because the, you know, we used to say mutual funds do well, people don't. Uh, so you, wow. you know, that's the system two process. You know, a lot of times you need a co-pilot with that. So what would you say? Because that's an emotional reaction. Like mm-hmm. that's very much system two that you want to avoid. Well, no, no it's system, system one. Yeah, you want to avoid system one because you're gonna like the stock markets. I, my, I had a friend of mine. He's probably listening because he listens to the show. He was timing the stocks. He's been doing it for a while and he's getting away with it. And he 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 ended up he ended up selling his stock a week into COVID nineteen, and mm-hmm. then he bought it back three weeks in, thinking it'll swing, and it went down more. Oh. He said, and he said, oh, I didn't win that one. I said, well, you, you, know, you can never win that one. That's just pure guessing. Right. Because no one knows. I mean, we don't know until the data, data sinks. But, um, you know, the, the, the idea is buy high, sell low. So he was trying to cheat the system. But system one will always respond. If you're looking at the headlines, you'd never leave the house in some states. Yeah. I don't know why. It's, it's coincidental that some states are like, hey, it's great. Go out and have a good time. And there's other states where never go out. I went up to Boston this weekend. My 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 sister started terrorizing me because I didn't. I went on a plane. Oh really? I said, yeah, I wanted to go see my kids. Yeah, it was fine. I didn't have a problem with it. <laughs> I got a good example of you guys. I don't know if you remember this from the book, but it was a kind of a detailed one. But I had to bring it up. Um, mm-hmm. It's about absurdiveness. It's up there on the screen too, if you want to read along. But I wanted to read it if you don't mind. Go. So there was a, a major advance in the understanding of the availability hur- heuristic occurred in the early 1990s when a g- group of German psychologists led by Norbert Schwartz raised an intriguing question. How will people's impressions of the frequency of a category be affected by a requirement to list a specific, a specific number of instances? Imagine yourself a subject in the experiment. So this is how the experiment goes. First, you list six instances which you behaved assertively. Now evaluate your assertiveness. Imagine that you have been asked for 12 instances of assertive behavior, a number most people find difficult. Would you view your own assertiveness to be different? So basically, in, long, in short, because it's kind of long, the request to list 12 instances pits the two determinants against each other. One, on one hand, you just have retrieved an impressive number of cases in which you were assertive. On the other hand, while their first three or four instances... <laughs> of your own assertiveness probably came easily to you. You almost certainly struggled to come up with the last few to complete a set of 12. Fluency was low, which will count more, the amount retrieved or the ease and fluency of the retrieval. So, Steve, as someone that understands that, give yeah. a, uh, a Cliff Notes version for what that, that will Sure, this last paragraph is kind of the Cliff Notes. So, the contest yielded a clear-cut winner. People who had just listed 12 instances rated themselves as less assertive than people who had listed only six. Furthermore, participants who had been asked to list 12 in which they had not behaved assertively ended up thinking of themselves as quite assertive. So basically, when they tried to list more, so they had to list 12, because it became harder as the list got longer, they felt they weren't assertive because they're like, oh, I can't 
find ways I'm assertive. So they're like, I'm not an assertive person. And the same was true for the people that were trying to list ways they weren't assertive. Mm -hmm. Like if they had to list all these behaviors wow. of I'm Thank not you. assertive in this way, the first three or four <laughs> were easy. <laughs> and the last, however many, were so hard that they're like, oh, I must be assertive because I can't think of ways I'm not assertive. Think, so let me... Go ahead. Go ahead. No. I was just going to say, let me make sure that I, I got it. I think yeah. I do. I think I get it. So... The the question is, are you assertive? Yeah. And if so, list the ways that you're assertive. Assert no, assertive. I think it's the other way around. So you list, you just try to list them, and then you evaluate if you're assertive based on the list you came up with. Right, right. But step one is listing. Yeah. Okay. So list twelve ways you're assertive. Assertive, and then the other group lists six. Yes. And the group that listed twelve thought at the end of the day they were less assertive because they struggled to get the last ones, whereas yeah. the group that did six. That's that's an example of the framing thing. It's uh, it's, it's under kind of, availability. It, yeah, which well, yeah, he he goes through them all, but you're framing it's, the question in a way that the people that struggle with the harder exercise will think more poorly of themselves. It's it, yeah, it was mainly right? about like uh, cognitive ease and cognitive yeah. fluency, yeah. Um, and it was just so interesting because you would think people that listed more right yeah that have a bigger list and crazy awesome. yeah. Hey Steve, would you rather have a, a surgery? Where you have a ten, yes. <laughs> where you have a ten percent chance of dying. Yeah, this is. Or a different surgery where you have a ninety percent chance you'll survive. Which one would you rather have? Ninety percent. <laughs> but that's <laughs> right. the framing, right? Yeah, it's framing. That's the. I love that, because some people say you have a ten percent chance of dying. Like, take it from someone who's been on the other end of that. The, you know, the, I I took a test. At, you know, and the test was called the MELD score, which is a model for end stage liver disease. The first time I heard it was in September of 2016, mm -hmm. and I never heard of it. And he goes, what's your MELD score? I says, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I was at Harvard. And he says, oh, yours is, uh, yours is uh, 37. And he goes, 70%. You have a 70% chance of being dead in 90 days. That's what he told me. That was exactly what he told me. He didn't tell me I had a 30% chance of being alive. He should have read this book. Yeah. Does that sound better, though? I'd rather hear the 30% chance I mean, of being alive, wouldn't you? Know. Maybe he needed to scare the piss out of you, though. No, he said it as if he was having a cough, sip out of his coffee. This oh. guy did not. <laughs> and he, they said the number pretty regularly. That was a number you traded. But some people say, you know, what's a meld of, of 40 is like you're 90% chance you'll be dead in 90 days. You're 90%, not yeah. a 10% chance you'll survive. Oh, no, totally. Get, like framing. It would have been a lot nicer. But yeah, I'm saying it probably guy. worked out for the best because you like you took it so seriously. Oh, it pissed me off. Yeah, I mean yeah. you. Yeah, changed your habits. Yeah, I hate you. statistics. I mean, there's a zero percent chance I believed them. Like I, I was. Like, <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, like no. Imagine if you said that to him. I did. I said I'm not. You know, you're wrong. Like there's there's, there's a, always a chance. That's the whole idea. But if you're framing something and selling, you know, you're you always want to frame the high side. Mm -hmm. Not the low side, All right? Because they're statistically identical. There was one more caveat with that example. What's you still that? going to that yeah. thing? No, no one got it really to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're going through something everyone doesn't know. Wait, so you, you just said I'll give you a short example. You took 20 minutes to read it. <laughs> but okay, but you guys get it now. Like that, it's pretty simple, right? Yeah. Okay, so the other caveat that was really interesting <laughs> that if they did the same experiment, right, the same test to have people list these things, if they said, "Hey, we're going to play music." that makes this harder or we're going to play music to make it easier it that would reverse that so for example oh, if they were saying like okay we're going to have you list 12 but we're going to play music that's going to make it hard to think while you do so right. then they had trouble well, since they had trouble they're like mm -hmm. oh it's the music <clears throat> they had an excuse for why it was difficult mm -hmm. so instead of saying they had trouble being a uh, listing of assertive behaviors right. and they were like oh I'm not assertive they had an excuse and I thought that was so interesting because it says I wrote that in my notes fluency was removed when an excuse can be used such as difficult music so when they have so in this experiment right. when you have cognitive uh, overload or like the fluency is low right. <laughs> you're laughing at <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so yeah the music uh, did I say three or four no, no, no. <laughs> he's just laughing. So yeah, when the when you had an excuse, I thought that was so interesting. When you have nothing to, uh, you instead of pointing it to yourself, you're like, oh, the music did it. It's an excuse. Blame, well, that's huh? that's a interesting concept because we did a book. I forget which one. I think it's Habits. Um, no, it might have been Riveted, and it was an experiment that they the Marriott Hotel did with their staff because they were complaining about oh, they were over they were overweight. As a, as a group, they're they're unhealthy. The health insurance companies give you all that data, and they 
and they took one group and said that, um, you know, uh, you're working a 40 hour work week. They had a control group. They did no changes. And then they gave another group data. They said, as a housekeeper, did you realize that you're walking like six miles a day doing your job? The control group uh, had no change in, in weight. The, the, ma- the, the, the people that learned the data lost weight. And another one was that uh, there was a two control groups, and it was women. Mm-hmm. And they had Asian women and non-Asian women, right? And the first group was told, women do poorly at math. And they gave them a test. And the second group said, Asians are better at math than non-Asians. So the Asian women, the Asians did better than the, the non-Asian women. Like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Did I get that right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, well, they give you the data, say, you know, if someone says women are worse at math, all right, they do worse on their tests, and then the Asians are better at math than non-Asians. And the, and the second group in the same test uh, outscored them significantly. Oh. They were primed, they were framed. It's all kind of the same thing. You kind of set the deal up, set the stage, so to speak. You hear that with kids in school, too? Like, yeah. when you set the standard the right way, people believe themselves to be something. You know, yeah, you give them a reputation to live up to, right? That's right. Good or bad. I'm bad at math. I'm great at math. So I was joking around with my buddy. We're working on kind of a creative, creative project. And uh, he's like, you know what's great about you? And he's like, you turn things around in two days tops. And I was like, oh, it sounds like you're giving me a reputation to live up to. <laughs> oh, <laughs> did I do that to you? No. Uh, uh, I'm done that. You catch me now. I oh, I know use, all that stuff. I, I know. I, I know your little any of my bag stuff. of cognitive biases. I can't use. Uh, <laughs> I can't use that stuff. There's another another great example in here, and then uh, I think this would probably be enough. It's, it's called the. It was called the Honesty Jar. It was a company that gave away coffee, or it was tea. It was England, and they had a tea, a free tea, and they had a jar, and the jar was to put a contribution. They had suggested price. Mm-hmm. So the first jar was no no sign, right? The second jar. An, another day was a flowers. There was a picture of a flowers above the jar, and the third the third sign was two eyeballs, with the you know on the sign, mm-hmm. and the one with the eyes like implying that they're being watched outperformed the other two by two to one. See stuff like that's from a horror movie. That's, yeah, that's like, terrifying. That two eyes. How creepy is that? <laughs> I let them keep it. Keep the coffee. <laughs> I don't want your coffee. Um, I got to say one more thing that's similar to what you were just saying. Yeah. Uh, it's probably my favorite part that I I got to in the book. It's the causes trump statistics like we like stories over statistics but one thing he mentioned in the book he said people who are taught surprising statistical facts about human behavior may be impressed to the point of telling their friends what they learned but this does not mean their understanding of the world has changed so he, he all these different things that he was saying like about human behaviors he's teaching classes that a lot of times these things were able to be understood, like you hear this interesting behavior, but it doesn't actually change the way. And he says the test of learning psychology, whether you learned it or not while he was teaching, was whether your understanding of those situations when you encounter them has changed, not whether you learned a new fact. And I thought that was just really, really good. And That's I think awesome. about that a lot. I like well, that. you mentioned assertiveness. Remember we were talking about the other book about assertiveness? Like mm. assertiveness is a hugely awesome quality, I think, when people are assertive. I know that was just an example versus being passive or being aggressive. Because we were looking at a relationship book as a possible um, book that you can put, because in business you can be passive, meaning kind of let, let things go. You could be aggressive. You can be like a bull. And then you could be passive aggressive, which is the worst one, right? Where you just, you, you just, you like don't care. Passive aggressive is tough. Yeah, yeah, you'll say whatever. And then, the, the antidote in this book called Love Yourself was be assertive, you know, instead of being passive, because passive people usually make you pay later. They're like, put up with it. The example he gave was, you you know, if you're dating someone and you're bringing them to concerts to hang out with your buddies and you're going to your restaurants, ultimately they might say, hey, let's go meet my parents. And you're like, whoa, I don't want to meet your parents. And then they flip out. They say, I went to the restaurants. I hung out with your dumb friends. And they, <laughs> they unload. It's like, I want to be paid back. That's like passive, and then aggressive is just being nasty, you know, being, you know, just really aggressive. And then passive aggressive is you agree, but you will definitely just screw it up on purpose and watch them react. Mm. But the, the, the answer is assertive. Like, this is what I want to do. 
And this is the negotiation part. This is where we start our negotiation. I've learned that the hard way so many times. It's just being assertive and communicating is is always better. It's just difficult, you know? Yeah. You're pretty good at that. Yeah, you're, you're pretty good at that, at being assertive. I think I find myself being passive sometimes. And then when I get pissed off that I'm being passive, I become aggressive. Yeah. And who knows? Maybe passive aggressive. I don't really know that. You chandelier? Well My chandelier. I get I'm pissed off. You want to let them know what we got next week? Take it away, man. <laughs> so we're doing uh, <laughs> four hour work. We're week. doing four hour work week by uh, Tim Ferriss, or as this book states, Timothy Ferriss. But um, I read this years ago, years, years, years mm -hmm. ago. Um, it was a really good book. A lot of great stuff on on automation, simplification, um, helping your money work for you, putting yourself in a position to win. Just a lot of good good tactics and stuff in there. So getting, getting the way out, it. yeah, getting out, getting the way out of thinking in yourself. Like I got to work. I got to be working to be productive. Right. You know, don't feel guilty. Like we've all been programmed to be guilty if you're not out there working 20 hours, like your parents did. Right. You know, yeah. Like your grandfather worked 80 hours a week. It's like, well, I work four, but that's not not the way it is yet. But that'd be kind of cool. Yeah. Who was it that said uh, to be truly wealthy is to make money while you sleep? Isn't that a famous quote from someone? Warren Buffett? Was it? That sounds. Bad. You can throw any <laughs> financial stuff in the Warren Buffett. Warren camp. Buffett. That works. Somebody. I. I've heard that quote. And Napoleon Hill. <laughs> I don't know. Cool. All right. We'll see you guys next week. Take care. See you.